First of all, apologies if you can hear anything in the background. My neighbours are currently doing some work outside. And second of all, I am wearing my McLaren F1 gear as it is our car launch in two hours time. So I'm getting excited and prepared for that. And I can't be bothered to put a Chelton shirt on really because... <sighs> Here we go. My infamous series is back. What the fuck is going on at Charlton Athletic is making its return. I said it when Thomas Sangard took over the club in 2020 that it would be the final time I do an episode of that series for a number of years. Two and a half years later, we find ourselves in a very similar situation, unfortunately. The club is just... It's a circus. It's, it is an absolute circus. And uh, it's, it's just not a football club. It's just a shambles at this point. And... It's got to stop. The amount of details that have come out over the last couple of months, and spe especially today within the last hour at the time of recording this video, some serious developments have come out. So I felt the need to discuss it in a separate video now. I didn't obviously do a video um, from Saturday's game against Fleetwood. I do apologise for that. But yeah, I don't think you really want to see a video on that, to be fair, because it was just such a deflating and frustrating game to watch we played absolutely shocking to be honest with you didn't deserve three points whatsoever i need to discuss this um because this is just such a mess such a complicated issue and so much to delve into it that i need to do a video on it so welcome ladies and gentlemen to the latest installment of the soap opera of charlton athletic football club so i guess we'll begin where this all started back in december where of course the person in question that i am talking about in regards to the latest takeover of the club is, of course, Charlie Meffin. Now, most of you will know Meffin from his time at Sunderland. And, of course, the Netflix series Sunderland Till I Die shows him off for the world to see, really. And it's not hard to see why this guy is such a controversial figure in regards to Sunderland fans and in regards to football itself. Now, for those of you who don't know, Meffin was, of course, Sunderland's I believe Chief Executive Officer, he was their CEO, I'm not entirely sure, and was the front man that led to Stuart Donald's and Juan Satori's takeover of Sunderland uh, in 2018 when Ellis Short, of course, sold the club. The club was in absolutely dire straits, as the documentary um, highlights really well. They were £150 million in debt, losing to £20 million a season. Uh, short, of course, before leaving the club, um, wiped all the debt away for uh, Donald and Satori and Meffin to come in and take over the club. There were some positives in regards to it or some very little positives that I'm trying to take from their ownership at first. There was investment in the squad uh, initially when they went down to League One. Obviously not much. They can't really do an awful lot being in League One, but there was investment. You can't really argue with that. They were spending money. Um they obviously broke the record for the most season ticket holders in League One, but then again, that's not really surprising considering Sunderland have one of the best fan bases in the country. They've got 49,000 seat stadium in League One, and with the fans that they have, it's not really surprising that they had that amount of season ticket holders at their ground last year, uh, that season, sorry. And of course, uh, they broke the record for the most attendance in, in a third division game in history. Um, obviously in England with their game at Bradford City on Boxing Day with 46,000 fans, I think it was. Again, hardly surprising, but the documentary did show their marketing plans and obviously they were able to achieve that goal, which is fair enough. There's some of the positives I've tried to take from the ownership, but ultimately there is just so much controversy surrounding it. I mean, to begin with, the money that they paid to uh, to buy the club was allegedly from the parachute payments that Sunderland received when they got relegated from the Premier League. I don't know how true that is, but... That's what I've read. Uh, they received a £10 million loan, which was leveraged against the club's assets, which tells you all you really need to know about the people that Meffin brought in. Stuart Donald did not have a pot to piss in, really. He had absolutely no money about him. That was made evidently clear uh, from the documentary and also didn't really know what he was doing with his money. That's obviously made evident from the Will Grigg transfer and the controversy that surrounded that. And in terms of Juan Satori, he still remains an ambiguous character to this day. We still don't know a lot about him. The documentary didn't really showcase much of him, if not anything from him. We've got the academy issue where they sold a number of their highly rated youngsters, Barley Mumba and Sam Greenwood to name a couple. Uh, his dealing with staff, which again, the documentary showcases quite well. And probably the thing that's annoyed Sunderland fans more than anything else is Meffin's relationship with their fans and the comments that he's made in the past. In September 2018, as this shows here from what I'm reading, he referred to a number of Sunderland fans as parasites, referring to those that used illegal streaming to watch the game when they couldn't go to games. He actually apologised for that statement, but nevertheless, the statement 
was still made. Um, then there's obviously the one about entrepreneurs where he said that people from the Northeast don't understand business. And of course, his comments um, about Sunderland fans, ironically, in the playoff final against Charlton Athletic back in 2019. Some fans need to get realistic about that. Char Charlton have been in the Premier League for much of the last 20, 30 years and they had 40,000 fans there t t today to our 34,000 fans there today. So on sheer size of club, it's hard to say that Charlton were the ones who had to stay down. Um, I thought the Charlton fans were, were very loud, very vocal today. I thought our fans were quiet. It tells you all you really need to know and it tells you why Sunderland fans really resent this guy. So while there were a couple of, of positives going into the transfer, win, uh, going into the ownership, sorry, um, it's just shrouded in controversy and just ill treatment of staff, lack of funding, you know, just lies. Ultimately, him and Sangard are very similar characters in that they are all talk and no action, you know, setting unrealistic standards for their managers. I mean, Methvin apparently set a 100-point target for Jack Ross when he was well out of his depth to achieve that target. And he also, to be fair to him, didn't have a squad that could achieve that target. And then, obviously, they appointed Phil Parkinson after that, which was probably even more underwhelming than what they had before. I may as well just get into my early thoughts now. I don't want Charlie Muffin at the club. It's as simple as that. I don't want him to take over Charlton. Obviously, that's not me saying I don't want Sangard to sell the club. I do. I think he needs to sell the club. Well, now more than ever, especially considering the controversy that's now come out of these dealings. But he just needs to pack up shop and go, really. Obviously, we know he's been trying to hold on to a certain stake in the club. Apparently, he wants 20% stake in the club still. Why? I have no idea. But... Yeah, um, like I say, I do want him to sell the club, but I don't think Methvin is the answer. Obviously, there is the argument of, you know, we've got to be careful what we wish for. And ultimately, Methvin, you know, we don't know if he is going to end up being bad for us, but his CV at Sunderland doesn't exactly suggest that he's going to be good for the club. But I think what I liked about the Charlton fans' reception to this is that they weren't willing to, you know, welcome him with open arms. You know, I think for the first time since, uh, well, first time in a long time, actually, we were sort of sitting there like, OK, right put your money where your mouth is and you need to prove yourself because ultimately that's not just for Miffin. I think that's for any owner that comes in now. I go back to December in regards to um, the Miffin takeover, of course, December of last year now, um, because that was when he was first sighted um, going to games at the Valley. He was pictured a number of times and we were sat there thinking, this can't be good news. You know, when, when it first came out, we were sat there thinking, oh, he's going to be interested in buying the club, isn't he? And it was around this time, of course, where Ben Garner was sacked and he was replaced by current manager Dean Holden. And Dean Holden was not the only person to be appointed at that time. We also appointed Andy Scott as the club's technical director to help with the club's recruitment over the January transfer window. And of course, a chief operating officer or COO in Jim Rodwell and Ed Warwick as the club's finance director, I do believe. Now, as I explained in that video uh, that I made about Holden's appointment and the other senior members of staff, is that the two latter, Rodwell and Warwick, had connections to Methvin. Rodwell was at Sunderland when Methvin owned the club, and he is just as resented as much as uh, Methvin is. And as for Ed Warwick, of course, we discussed that he and Methvin owned a company slash investment group slash fund, whatever you want to call it, entitled SE7 Partners, which sounds... Very ESI. Too fucking right it is. That is going to be used to take over the club. And the second thing is that all of the senior members of staff that were appointed, Scott, Rodwell and Warwick, except Dean Holden, have now left the club. That was what the rumour was. That has now officially been confirmed today. They are now no longer at the club. Holden, of course, signed a uh, deal until the end of the season. Uh, Scott signed a deal into the end of the January transfer window, which sounds completely bizarre at the time, but it turns out to be true because he's now no longer at the club. And with Rodwell and Warwick leaving as well, it seems that they signed similar deals. Now, what we've understood with those members of staff being appointed is that they were appointed to facilitate the Miffin takeover. They were entirely Miffin's choices, is what I want to say. A part of me does want to think, though, that Sangard would have obviously, well, I say a part of me, Sangard would have had to agree to this, obviously, because Mephin doesn't actually own the club. So Sangard would have, would have had to agree to Holden's appointment and agree to the other members of staff coming in. But the bottom line is they were brought in to facilitate the Mephin takeover. And obviously they've now left because the Mephin deal has now collapsed. <laughs>
There was a lot of rumors of American buyers. I think there was Australian at some point, British, and I think at one point Qatari, which I thought was quite interesting. The consortium has been linked with the likes of the Mansour group, Mohammed Mansour, of course, who have been involved in football for a while now. They own, obviously, FC Norgeland, I do believe. They own a academy in Ghana, the Right to Dream Academy, which has produced some pretty decent talent from Ghana, obviously Mohamed Kudus being the main one, currently playing for Ajax. I did mention that link to Mansour when Holden was appointed, obviously that was a video that I said was definitely worthy of another video, but it never came to fruition, which I am sorry for. But obviously Mefin has since confirmed that he has no connections in the Mansour group whatsoever. Another person he's been linked with recently is the Lenigan family. Of course, Ian Lenigan is the chairman of uh, the Wigan Warriors, the rugby club. And his son, Simon, was supposedly uh, part of the consortium as well. I believe he was the former, he was a former shareholder at Oxford United, I think, and was also the previous chairman of the Football League. Fast forwarding all the way to very recently uh, last week, obviously past the transfer window and obviously with the uh, recent turn of form that Holden has had, which of course is, is fantastic. He's been a breath of fresh air and the other three board members leaving the club. A lot of details were coming out in regards to um, the ownership and how close it was. Now, Meffin was in an exclusivity period with Thomas Sangard uh, to take over the club. That was knowledge that we already knew and a number of potential buyers were also interested. But of course, Meffin had the exclusivity period, so it was mainly him dealing with it. He was in pole position to take over. Now, details were suggesting that the takeover was in the fee of £8.5 million. That was the fee that the club was going to be sold for. And as mentioned, he would be uh, getting the majority stake in the club. Sangard, according to this, as I'm reading from Ben Ransom's tweet, he would be getting 90% stake in the club. So Sangard would be holding on to 10%. Meffin would get 90 But as we know, the deal collapsed. The deal fell through, I believe, on Friday. I think the takeover was supposed to go through on Thursday the 9th. And on Friday, Sangard basically sent a letter to Meffin to say, jog on, basically, to say the deal's off. Now, initially, before any details, or I say initially, before details came out about this, I did sit there and go, well done, Sangard. Because Meffin, as I say, is not the answer. I don't think he is the right man to take over the club due to his controversy. And I was actually quite happy to see Sangard um, turn this away. But while I do think that was good news in regards to the Meffin deal falling through, you, you do have to beg the question now. Does Sangard, like, what are his intentions? Does he actually intend on selling the club? Does he still intend on holding a stake? Who does he intend on selling to, if not Meffin? You know, who are the other people involved that are trying to buy the club? Who are Who is the plan B that he's mentioned, basically? Like, we need, these are very serious questions. And obviously, if you look at Dean Holden's cryptic uh, interview after the Fleetwood game on Saturday to, the, uh, to BBC London Sport, he used the phrase, I've absolutely loved my time at the club. Not, I absolutely love my time at the club. I have absolutely loved, past tense, loved my time at the club. So it does seriously hint, and especially if you make the correlation to Holden being linked to the Huddersfield job, which, thank God, seems to not be the case as Neil, Neil Warnock, the legend that he is, seems to be coming out of retirement and taking that job. It, it, it did link at the time that Holden could be well on his way out of the club. Now, the South London Press did confirm that Sangod is apparently in talks to give Holden a new deal, which of course is very positive, very good news, because Holden has been a breath of fresh air since coming to the club. He's obviously reinstated somewhat the confidence within the players, and we look a lot better under him than what we did on the Ghana. But as I say, those question marks need answering. You know, Holden ultimately is, you know, out of contract at the end of the season, and he was brought in to facilitate the Meffin takeover. Now that's not happening. It's like, well, What's going on now? Do you know what I mean? Like, why did you choose not to sell to Meffin? You know, because Sangard doesn't really reveal that in the South London Press article. He just says, oh, there were very specific terms that they didn't agree to. What do you want about? As it says here, um, he agreed an £8.5 million deal to buy 90% of the club uh, in mid-December. That was when the deal was confirmed. That's when the exclusivity period started. It then goes on to detail the people that were involved in the, um, the takeover. So it said the consortium consisted of Gabriel Brenner, who holds a stake in the Houston Dynamo, and Joshua Friedman. Brenner recently attended a match where he made contact with key figures with the CFC community. It goes on to say here that the takeover... 
uh, was subject to EFL approval. I think the owners of the director's test had been lodged to the EFL, so that was awaiting um, ratification. It is believed that they had paid a substantial deposit in regards to the ownership. Now, I don't know the exact number, but the number that I've seen flying around is £850,000. Don't know if that's true, but that's what I've seen. Money that they had to facilitate the takeover, and I'm guessing the money that they had that they were going to use to invest in the club and for the for the for the takeover basically was in a bank account, and they basically got a letter from Sandgard, I think on Friday, saying the deal's off. A circus. It's a circus. It's exactly what it is. It is an absolute shambles. What has happened here? You know, like how. Uh, I, I'm lost for I'm not, I'm, at, I'm at a loss for words. I can barely get my words out. I'm I'm actually like. I I, I just. I'm still struggling to get my words out, man. It's just like, it's got to stop. This this has to stop. You know, I, I'm sick and tired of this club just being taken the piss out of. We are just constantly getting done in by, like, potential owners. Like, it's not just even owners. It's potential owners as well. Like, how this group is considered, like, the suitable ones to have the exclusivity period. And then for Sangar to turn around and go, yeah... Like, I don't want to sell, like, and then not giving a thorough reason as to why. You know, it's just like, I, I don't get it. It's just an absolute shambles, and it's just, well, another day at the office, really. It's just another day at the office when it comes to Charlton Athletic. Now, the one thing I want to draw your attention to when it comes to the random tweets in regards to um, the takeover falling through is the number of personnel uh, involved in the takeover. Now, of course, one of the people that he listed, Joshua Friedman, I must say, don't know who he is. I haven't done my research in regards to him, but I did research... The uh, the first guy that he mentioned, which of course was Gabriel Brenner, who, as he said, has a stake in MLS side Houston Dynamo. Now, this is a minority stake. He isn't the majority owner of the Houston Dynamo. He is a minority shareholder. Um, but as Ransom reported, he has been at games recently. He's been speaking to members of the community. But uh, the thing that I will say in regards to uh, this... Uh, this individual specifically is his time at Houston Dynamo has been well it's been shocking to be totally honest with you over the last couple of years Houston Dynamo have been one of the worst performing teams in the Western Conference I think in 2019 they were I think 10th with 40 points and then the season after that they dropped to like the bottom of the Western Conference with 21 that like they've been on well I say that they've been on a, a steady incre uh, a steady improvement over the last couple of years but they've still been like right at the bottom of the conference. Richard Cawley reported literally today, before he actually reported that, it was uh, reported by him that we are apparently going to get a new CEO, which is Peter Story. Now, Peter Story has been working down under in recent months. He is, the, I believe, the CEO of A-League side, the Central Coast Mariners, and he had had previous connections to Portsmouth. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to his time at Portsmouth, he had been arrested alongside a number of other individuals, including Harry Redknapp, in terms of corruption back when the club were facing administration. He was actually cleared of this charge, um, but still, to even be connected with that and to be arrested for a charge like that, not exactly a good thing. And he oversaw their time at the club when they went into administration. Oh, fuck off. And you taking the fucking piss? Why? Like, like, just why? Like, if this happens, if this does end up happening, it's just like... It's like I say, it's just the shambles. It's just, a, it's a circus. It's just us being passed on constantly to another chancer, to another controversial figure, to a, someone that is just a wrong one. Like, and we're just getting constantly passed down over the years. The statement that the Methin Group made today in relation to their legal action um, that they're going to take against Tom, Thomas Angard, which again just highlights the absolute shambles that it is. So this is the statement that Richard Cawley tweeted that the Methin Group said. Our group refutes Thomas Sangard's claim last Friday, February 10th, that we are in breach of the signed agreement by Clear Ocean Capital, the holding company of Charleston Athletic. We were expecting to complete the deal last Thursday, February 9th. A substantial deposit had been paid. As I say, that fee was believed to be £850,000. The agreed purchase price had not changed. That was £8.5 million. The money required was in the relevant bank accounts and owners and directors test applications had been lodged with the EFL. Of course, I did mention that uh, just a moment ago. Our clear legal advice is that we are still in exclusivity to complete the purchase and we still expect to do so imminently as stipulated by the agreement on December 20th, signed by Mr. Sangard. 
We note Mr. Sengod's statement that he has been conducting discussions with other potential investors and has been working on a plan B. Such actions were and are in contravention of the exclusivity agreement and any third party participating in such discussions would be committing torturous interference for which the penalties are significant. We note also that Mr. Sengod's removal of the entire senior management of Charlton Athletic also in contravention of the December 20th agreement. This, together with attempting to renege on the deal, has introduced unwelcome uncertainty and instability to the club and its fans. After a brief period where a competent management team has started to plan constructively for the club's future. We urge Mr. Sangard to complete the signed deal he previously agreed without the necessity of legal action. <laughs> Here we go again. Here we go again. It's just like, it just goes back to the whole like ESI thing, doesn't it? Like it just sounds so deja vu and I'm just sick of it at this point. Like it's just, <sighs> I don't even know where to start when it comes to breaking this down. I mean, I have just, I've just mentioned obviously that substantial deposit was paid, money was in the bank accounts, the owners and directors test was being lodged to the EFL, that was awaiting approval, they were going to take over the club. They say, they say here that their current legal advice is that they still are in exclusivity period. I'm not entirely too sure what to make of this now because Rick Everett did come out and say today that he uh, thinks that that is a lie. He said that apparently the exclusivity period ended on transfer deadline day, which of course was when uh, Scott, uh, Rodwell and Warwick's contracts were up. And then you've got them saying here, you know, Sangard talking to other third parties as a plan B, as an alternative to the Methin takeover was in breach of the agreement that they had and sacking the senior management team uh, was also in breach of that agreement. Like, it's just, uh, I'm at a loss for words, people, to be honest with you. Like, I really did not think that we was going to end up in a similar situation to what we were, to what we had before Sangard took over the club because it honestly... It feels like that. It does. It does feel like that. You know, it just feels like we're just being constantly screwed over, screwed over constantly by the wrong people. Like, can we ever just get, like, like decent owners for once? Like, it's just absolutely, it's a piss take. The person who comes in, the party that comes in, has to make buying the valley and the training ground off of the Chatelet their number one priority. That wasn't Meffin's priority. And, and that's why this club will not progress. This club will not progress until Ronald de Chatelet's connection with the club is completely gone. We're not going anywhere. Like that, that has to be the number one priority now. And I don't know who that's going to be. I don't know. Like I say, I don't want it to be Charlie Meffin. But now with this whole thing kicking off, you just got to sit there and say, well, we just got to sit back and just wait for this to be resolved and then obviously as i say there's other third party um third party consortiums involved peter varney is allegedly one of them i would like to see him actually do something because unfortunately over the last couple of months i've seen him to be another person who's all mouth no trousers if you know what i mean you know he's been all talk you know bigging up this potential buyer you know he told us to get down the valley for the carabao cup round of 16 game against brighton which we did in our numbers seventeen thousand. Like, I don't, I don't know what the plan is here when it comes to that. And I don't know what the plan is in regards to the club in general. You know, we've got Dean Holden who's demanding answers. You know, he wants a bigger contract. You know, he, he's hinting at a move away. If Holden was to walk now, I wouldn't blame him. Because who would want to take the job at this club right now? Like, who would? This club is an absolute shambles. And I feel so sorry for him. And if he's to walk now... I wouldn't blame him, but it would be absolutely catastrophic for this club. And I think the same applies for the Methin takeover. It's really, it's so confusing. It just has to be resolved. Otherwise, we're just going to end up in, you know, problems. Like, well, I mean, we already are in problems, but even more than what we were in before. And yeah, that that's all... That's all I need to say, really. I apologise that it's all, all over the place. I've tried my best to describe it. I'm just... Like, I'm just sick of it. I'm like every other Charlton fan out there right now. I'm just completely sick of this club just being taken the mick out of constantly by people that don't know what they're doing. And by people that are not the right ones to take this club forward. Like I say, I don't want Methin to take this club forward. But now we're left in a situation where this has to be resolved. Whether he actually does take over the club and we have to sit there and go, OK, he's here now. They have to win the fans' trust because, like I say, we have just been absolutely taken the piss out of for years. And I don't know where we go from here now. Well, it's in the hands of Sangard to deal with it now. 
and to find a potential other buyer if Meffin isn't the one that he deems it. But like I say, what does Sangard want to do with the club? What does he want to do? Does he want to keep a stake? Why didn't he sell to Meffin? What are the real reasons? And who does he intend on selling to, if anyone? Those questions need to be raised now. But yeah, we're just left in a situation where I don't know what's going to happen next. But like I say, it's just another episode of the soap opera, another episode of this absolute circus of a football club. Like I said, I've tried to describe it in the best way I can. It's very difficult to wrap my head around and it's very difficult because ultimately this is my club and it's just so painful seeing us in this position time and time again and I'm sick of it. And it has to be resolved sooner rather than later or this club's going nowhere. Simple as that. So thank you for tuning into this video, guys. I hope you did enjoy. Uh, you probably didn't, considering it is a topic that is very painful and just, like I say, we're sick of it at this point. But if you did enjoy it, I would appreciate if you would give it a like. Subscribe if you are new to the channel. Turn on post notifications so you're notified every time I upload a new video. We are getting ever so closer to 4,000 subscribers. If we could get to that very soon, that would be awesome. Let me know, guys, what do you think about this whole thing? Like I said, I've tried my best to describe it as, much, as best as I can. But I struggled to get my words out and probably struggled to make a lot of sense in this video because it's just so... It's just such a confusing topic and it's just so... Like... I'm at a loss for words. That is the latest episode of What the Fuck is Going On at Charlton Athletic. It will not be the last, I can tell you that, because... There's certainly going to be more details. We need to wait and see in regards to whether Peter Story comes in as the club CEO, which would be an absolutely disgraceful appointment from his time at Pompey, and whether the legal action is taken from the Methin group and what Sangard intends to do. So stay tuned for that video when that does come out. This has been Tyler Ronitson. Have a nice day, and I'll see you all on Wednesday for the match reaction against Forest Green. Take it easy, stay safe, and I'll see you all then. We're doomed.